I'm glad that the world hasn't ended. Um, there's a lot of conspiracy theories going around for a bit that the, the mere act of the moon moving yes. would in some way trigger some sort of apocalyptic thing. And of course, all of the media was buying into it. They knew. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. the media always knows. Yeah, the, I, as a member of the media, we know these things. Right. Uh, the world was supposed to end. Uh, that's why we were telling everyone to do like doomsday prepping and stuff. Totally not because the eclipse always causes like, oop, always causes a crazy amount of like traffic. Yeah. And we don't want people to be trapped in their cars for hours on end and starve. Or at least be a little peckish at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Literally all the doomsday prepping was make sure you have all the emergency gear in your car that you need and bring snacks. Yeah, my uh my my family lives near one of the like hot spots for the for watching the totality mm-hmm. and uh yeah, the the around there they were advising to basically prep as though you know, there was going to be a two week lockdown. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, it was like have emergency food and water on hand because they were expecting that many people to just be flooding uh, the Yellow Springs. Yes, the Yellow Springs. Ooh, outing yourself, doxing yourself. You got to be careful there a little bit. It's a town near. Also, we just straight up say where we're from all the time. I mean, we're in the greater Cincinnati area, in northern Kentucky. In northern Kentucky. The city of Covington. Anyway, um, not that any of that matters. What does matter, of course, is we got Outlaws of Thunder Junction yeah. set spoilers to talk about, as well as uh, a free Dungeons & Dragons adventure. Since they're partnering with LEGO, you can get a free adventure from them now, which is pretty cool in my mind. Um, but I do want to point out that this is not a solar eclipse podcast. No. No. No, we're day late, dollar short. Day, days and dollars. Many days, many dollars. Um, but this is ostensibly a Dungeons & Dragons and Magic the Gathering podcast. Of course, the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast. I am Connor. And I'm Sam. And we are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. And we like to talk about Magic the Gathering and D&D and other TCGs and other TTRPGs and all that kind of acronyms and such. Uh, we do want to to thank one of one of our sponsors for the podcast uh the proxy forge you can check them out at proxyforge.com for beautiful magic the gathering proxies they got a lot of cool stuff uh, if you use the link in our beacons link in the bio uh we have like a little support us tab. i just consolidated it all Lovely. into one so that it's like here's the one thing you can click to support us and then you have all the options and then all the podcast stuff in addition to all the socials and stuff at the top but yes. you can just click on on the how to support us thing you can find a proxy forge link there and you can get some cool proxies we play with them all the time when we play our monday night magic live streamed two-player brawl rules i know paper brawl brawl rules commander games with one another the proxy forge proxies tend to come up quite a bit we are a very pro proxy podcast as well yes as well play with play with the play with the good things of course of course uh we've taken a little bit of a break from the bonus action uh podcast they're little extra episodes where we have interviews and discussions with various people in tabletop rpgs and and magic the gathering and all that stuff we've had randy sackett of the forge realm on uh we've had the bearded gm himself we've also had ivy ceo of the crit awards the creator recognition and tabletop rpg awards show that started last year at gen con Second year, it's going to be this year. We're excited to go to that. Uh, we want to. We're, we're going to be getting back into that soon. It was just kind of a little. We we're trying it out just to see and try to do a little bit of collab. But we like to not spend the money on podcast recording software every month. Very so fair. we like to load them up and then do them all at once. Um, let's see. Let's see. Of course, the Duels and Mandrakes podcast you can get on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, all the various podcast services around the globe. And and if you do listen to the podcast and you like it regularly or you're just one of our friends who is listening to it then you should do a review on whatever your podcast service of choice is it's the best way to help us in the algorithm but sam what have you been playing what have you been, what, what, what's been going on in your life right now my life right now uh gaming wise of course god damn it there's a guy on tiktok who his whole bit is just doing things like a, a millennial and he talks like this a lot oh all the time and i've just been seeing a lot of his content oh, anyway god. um and that that just struck me i am so sorry was playing some fallout 4 for a while uh, was hoping to play the fallout 4 commander decks like a little pre-con pod uh that kind of fell through unfortunately just due to timing um of our friends availability yeah 
Are you planning on picking up any cards from the set? There are a couple of cards. Uh, a couple of they're like strong back. Um, is an aura, green aura, that would go really well in my Ivy Gleeful Spell Thief deck. Um, it reduces costs uh, to target with enchantments mm-hmm. by, I believe, three. Hmm. It seems a little excessive. It's pretty good. <laughs> and also buffs for having enchantments and equipment on the creature. Which is which is good, because you want to be casting it onto things that aren't Ivy and copying it onto her. That's fair. Exactly. That's fair. In the world of video games, though... Moved, uh, was playing a lot of Fallout 4, burnt myself out on that, as we do here in uh, in modern gaming. Yeah. It's burning ourselves out. Moved on to uh, Doom. Doom. 2016 Doom. I have I played it when it you know came out years ago, and I actually, there was a free game with gold this, with uh, PlayStation Plus this month that was The Immortals of Something. Mm. Immortals was, of Avium. Yeah, that one. It is a Doom-like, but like, also we it's weird it's a very weird it's like spell casting but guns spell casting but guns but my big problem with it is the dialogue and the plot the plot is hang on by a thread at all times i mean but the dialogue is they speak like we would speak here it's a very modern speech um but it's also supposed to be like a high fantasy sort of magitech world and so they're combining things like, ah, yes, we must go get the Crystal of Elysium in order to stop the Dreadlord from taking over the world. For real? For real, for real. <laughs> I mean, that's just that's just campy, dumb stuff. From what I've heard, the gameplay of it is is very fun. And it's okay. Isn't it like uh, like they're casting spells and then they like reload their fists and shit? Because you have to do like gunplay mechanics. It, it's literally just gunplay. Like I it, love it. The, it. You have a you have a, yeah, all times you have a rifle, a shotgun, or a, or a, um, a, a SMG basically equipped, and you can buff those with your different abilities. It's it's an alright game. I've heard I've heard it's very underrated and people. It, it was widely reviled when it came out and. There's been like a resurgence of people being like, this is actually a pretty good game. I don't hate it. I'm not though. Im- I'm not compelled to continue to play it, That's and thus fair. I downloaded Doom because Doom. Yeah, like I said, it's kind of a Doom like. Mm-hmm. Um, it, mm-hmm. and Doom is a very good game. That's fair. That's what fair. Are you, what, have, what have you been? What have you been munching on the gaming world? Well, of course, I'm I'm slowly working my way through Persona Five Royal in downtime at work. LOL. Hope no one, my bosses. Wa- There's no reason my bosses would watch this. Um, and then. With all of the hype surrounding Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, mm. I'm actually for the first time starting to play through Final Fantasy VII Remake, uh, one that's been on my backlog for a very long time, which if you know anything about me and my tastes in video games, you should probably be very surprised that I haven't yet played that game. Um, Kingdom Hearts kind of combat in a way. Um, I love Kingdom Hearts. Yeah. I love Final Fantasy. So the fact that I haven't played... I loved the original Final Fantasy VII. It's just I played the demo around when the remake came out. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And then I got distracted. <laughs> and I've been distracted ever since until now with all the the rebirth hype. I'm like, I might as well just might as well just get into that. But let's get into the upcoming releases for D&D and Magic the Gathering. We go over them every single week. Or every other week when we do the podcast. Every it's single a, podcast. Every single podcast, which is every other week. It's a whole. Don't worry about it. Samuel. Diving in. Uh, so in the D&D world, first up we have the Eye of Vecna. Sorry. Vecna, Eve of Ruin. Not to be confused with the Eye of Vecna, a magical item in D&D. Everyone's been calling it Eye of Vecna accidentally, too. Eve and I are great... one letter off. And the V, and the V yeah. is just a Y that had its that, that that much like some shelter cats had their tail chopped off. Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. So anyway, Vecna, Eve of Ruin. Uh, it's going to be available on D and D Beyond and at local game stores on May seventh with full retail on May twenty first. Uh, this also you can get Vecna, Nest of the Elder Chai, a prequel adventure for lower levels avail- and that'll be available with all pre orders and uh, for four ninety nine on D and D Beyond. Next up, not a D&D adventure, but more of a coffee table book, The Making of Original D&D, 1970 to 1976. That will be available on June 18th. And finally, the last one we have, uh, the last 5E. 2014's 5th edition. Yes, 2014's 5th edition book we have coming out will be Quest from the Infinite Staircase, this year's anthology book. That will be available on D&D Beyond at local game stores on July 9th, with the full release on July 16th. Next, we have the D&D 
5th edition 2024 revision. We're going to call it 1D&D. 1D&D. Uh, 1D&D, the player's handbook, will come out on September 17th. The Dungeon Master's Guide will come out on November 12th. And the Monster Manual will come out on February 18th of next year. All of them with a week early release on D&D Beyond as well. Moving on to Magic the Gathering, Outlaws of Thunder Junction. The pre-release is this Friday, if you're listening, if you're watching live or listening when it comes out, April 12th, with the full release on April 19th. We have Modern Horizons 3, which pre-release will start on June 7th, and re- the full release will be on June 14th. Assassin's Creed Universe is Beyond comes out on July 5th. Bloomboro will be uh, pre-releasing on July 26th, with full release on August 2nd. And finally, Duskmorn House of Horrors will be releasing in Q4 of this year. And of course, the Daggerheart playtest is out right now, if you are so inclined. It's probably one of the most popular non-D&D tabletop RPGs right now, I would say. Um, up there with the likes of uh, Pathfinder and stuff. And it's in beta. <laughs> it's in beta, and it's it's got a lot of cool stuff going on. So if you want to mold it into your perfect tabletop RPG, now is your opportunity. Uh, but, of course, Outlaws of Thunder Junction is releasing this weekend in pre-release. So we pretty much know all of the cards in the set. We know all the set mechanics. We know what the vibe is for Outlaws of Thunder Junction. And so we're going to just give you the whole set preview. We've talked about random things that have popped up as... Mm-hmm. As, uh, the weeks have gone on uh, but now we got our full overview of the entire set let's go over first the set specific mechanics there are five main mechanics uh, some of them are basically just other mechanics with extra steps much like how disguise was morph with an extra step everything is kicker everything is kicker for example spree which is kicker uh, <laughs> spree uh, appears on cards that have one, two, they're usually very low mana cost instants and sorceries. Uh, and then spree, you get to choose which modes you want to use on the spell, and they cost additional mana for each mode that you choose. Uh, so you can get very, you can get a very basic effect for very low mana. You can get a whole ton of effects if you dump a ton of mana into it. Uh, they're much more, they're very versatile. You got a lot of options with them. Even though they have a base mana cost and a spree cost with them, they also seem to be fairly reasonable in the mana cost for the effects that they're causing as well i think the effects uh usually from the ones we've we've seen them all now uh from the ones we've looked at a lot which one one of the red ones uh there's two it's red red and Mm -hmm. then the activated the either have add one generic to uh redirect a spell or you have one to copy a spell um a three mana deflecting slot where you can throw extra mana in to then get the spell that you are deflecting yeah. or a different spell <laughs> basically yeah exactly uh either of those is well costed mm-hmm. like those are pretty pretty on average but if you do both of them which of course you're not going to be doing both of them a lot of the time yeah um maybe in more interactive or, or or higher power games where the stack can get complicated but yeah, overall, I like the spree mechanic. I think I think the spree mechanic is probably the best one in the set, in my mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, the plot mechanic is a weird, isn't a weird spot. I think uh, it's nice. It is nice because yeah. uh, the whole thing with plot is that it is effectively foretell. But instead of foretelling for a standard of two mana and then spending more mana to cast it later, uh, which is usually l- which is less than the mana cost printed on the card. Um, you instead play pay the plot cost when you uh, put it face down, and then you can cast it at sorcery speed for free anytime on a future turn. You just can't do it on the same turn that mm-hmm. you plot it. Um, I like this more than foretell, just because it's one of those like you can keep things pretty low key in the early turns, and you're just kind of quietly plotting some stuff plotting (laughs) yeah and then you can have a big explosive turn where you don't need a lot of mana or Mm -hmm. if you run out of mana setting up a big turn then you have free payoffs that you've been just banking uh particularly with cards like fibblethip which make it a lot easier to plot cards and you can just plot plot off the top of your deck over and over again with a whole bunch of stuff which is cool yeah uh i'm Plot is one I'm very interested in. I do need I do need to see somebody online play this and play a deck they've built because I know there there's some broken stuff you can probably do with it. Oh, absolutely. But with it being just at uh, uh, the casting being at sorcery speed, that does change a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And obviously, like you could probably set up some huge like storm turns. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you leave yeah like leave basically gonna leave yourself open a little bit. Leave yourself open a little. All right. Cast one. No response? Cool. Next. Okay, priority? Cool. 
all right, now that I've cast five spells, storm off. Yeah. It's like, okay, I get it. It's cool. I'm interested to see how that one uh, plays out in a yes. longer. Uh, one that will certainly almost assuredly be ignored, except for some very specific interactions with powerful cards. Outlaws uh, is a new creature collective, uh, much like the party mechanic from D&D, where you had to have a wizard, a rogue, a warrior, and cleric. A, yes. Yeah. Some combination therein. Uh, now you have outlaws, which matter for assassins mercenaries pirates rogues and warlocks are now a collective um i think it's a bit less restrictive than the party mechanic where it wanted you to have one of each or Mm -hmm. multiple kinds within the party group whereas this just affects multiple creature classes yeah um while also it's just a lot easier to write out outlaws Mm -hmm. but then most of the time they have reminder text on them so it is it's a whole thing but with uh with rogues and assassins and pirates specifically you can be getting a lot of very powerful creatures that are getting bonus Mm -hmm. uh, effects like i believe there's one that like doubles etbs for outlaw things yeah i believe so which um i don't know if you know this but like uh uh dockside extortionist is a pirate yeah, he is. So there's some there's some powerful synergies with specific cards, uh, but I imagine that this isn't going to be something that we're going to see a lot of or come back in the future. I, I'm sure I I can imagine this because uh, like the party mechanic as you refer uh, as we were talking about earlier. It yeah it appeared in Zendikar. It reappeared in um, one of the Dungeons and Dragons set, and then from there it's kind of like. I'm I'm not gonna play with any party cards because that's too much work to think about. This is like you said a lot easier where it's just like mm-hmm. ah buff that creature and that and i guess my commander okay yeah uh there's certainly some commanders that you can also build around where you now have a new uh tribe that you can build around effectively Mm -hmm. that isn't just a single creature type uh but isn't just all creature types like a changeling deck or sure uh the we got two more mechanics. the The big one of this set that it has a lot of mecha- that has a lot of cards printed around it is committing a crime, uh, which is probably going to be the easiest thing to put online because it just references a type of game action that you're o- almost always doing in games. Yeah. Uh, it's committing a crime. To commit a crime, you have to cast a spell, activate an ability, or have a triggered ability that targets one or more of either an opponent. A spell or an ability opponent controls, a permanent an opponent controls, or a card in an opponent's graveyard. So effectively, just any if you're interacting with any of your opponent's stuff, you're committing a crime. Yes. Um, which on flavor. <laughs> every every time my board is interacted with, it's criminal. It's oh, a criminal absolutely. offense. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, you arrest them. Arrest them. Murder. So in any deck that wants to be interactive with the table uh these commit a crime cards are certainly going to be helpful i will say a lot most of the commit a crime cards uh have this activate so there's triggers only once per turn um definitely i can i can understand why they did that because some of these are very easy like commit a crime draw a card commit a crime do x uh could get out of hand very easily i mean that turns into um bounce an opponent's creature draw a card counter a spell draw a card yeah uh damage like it there's a lot even even if you're just like oh i cast opt but i have something that triggers a ping effect yeah now that's committed a crime and now i can it it can very much spiral out of control um there are several that don't have there are yeah. turn stipulations so keep an eye out for that legendary creatures especially mm-hmm. that's true uh the last core set mechanic is mount creatures and the saddle ability mount is just a new creature type that doesn't really mean anything in and of itself but uh, mount creatures tend to i believe all so far have the saddle ability yes which is basically crew yes um, instead of having an artifact that is not a creature until it is crude, these are still creatures, mm-hmm. and you can still attack with them as normal. And if you choose to tap other creatures that you control that have a collective power equal to or exceeding the saddle number, so saddle one, you need a creature of power one or more. And you can, of course, just over saddle a creature if you so desired. For mm-hmm. There's a million reasons you would want to tap your own things down. Um, but when a creature is saddled, When they attack or when they do some other action in the game, there's an additional benefit associated with it. Uh, Like the new Gitrog monster, uh, 
uh, when it attacks, you can sacrifice the creature that saddled it, and then you can, I believe it's draw cards equal to its mana value or something like that. And then uh, put, I believe, land cards tapped mm-hmm. onto the battlefield equal to its mana value as well. Yeah, so you get more um, you get more value out of attacking with these value. saddleable... Value. Uh, I do, I like this more than crew, but I also feel like it's by far the most niche ability Mm -hmm. in the set. Uh, I like it more than crew just because it's able to act on its own as a somewhat basic creature. Because a lot of them still have things like reach or trample or vigilance and that kind of stuff. Um, But it's, uh, I like it just from the perspective, I like it a lot from the perspective of being able to utilize 1-1 tokens uh, outside of just blockers Mm -hmm. or fodder to be taken out by a blocker. Yeah. I, uh, I think that the ones I've seen of the of the saddle mechanic, not a huge amount of creatures, not a huge amount of mounts in the in the set, um, but the saddle abilities I do like a lot of them more than I like a lot of vehicle abilities that yes, we see. Absolutely. Um, there's one. I mean, we'll uh, in a second we'll get into some uh, more interesting cards, but there's one in particular that uh, it's a little bit of a color break that I that I enjoy. And we'll talk about that in just a second. In a minute. In a minute. But one more. Uh, this isn't a core set mechanic. This is for the commander decks. Uh, much like with uh, March of the Machine, where they came with plane chase cards for like a little sub mini game going on during a commander game, they now have bounties uh, that are going to come with all of these commander decks. Effectively, it is a, an additional deck in the middle of the in the middle of the game, where you have after the. Starting player's third turn, you flip over the top one, and then uh, the bounty has some kind of a requirement where, like, at the beginning of your end step, you need to have done this Mm -hmm. uh, game action of some kind. And if you fulfill that, you then get a reward. Um, If you fulfill it the the very first turn that it's flipped up, you get a treasure token. Uh, and then for every turn that passes that it isn't fulfilled, once you fulfill it, you get more value, which is either additional treasure tokens or you add on the ability to draw cards. Uh, so very basic rewards. Uh, nothing as crazy as plane chase. It's a bit simpler yeah. than plane chase. Uh, just an, just another way to spice up and kind of speed up your commander games a little bit because I feel like a lot of games can fall into the trap of, all right, we've been playing for two hours because nobody has adequate interaction. Well, at least now we've got mana and card draw to help speed things up a little bit yeah and a lot of them they aren't they aren't complicated game actions either i know one of them is if you did not cast a spell this turn at the beginning of your end step you may claim this bounty yeah uh and that's going to be that's going to be very helpful for somebody who's like yeah i spend three turns i've made two land drops what do i do i've made two land drops or something like um your oh my god slime foot and squee mm. where you're doing a lot of you're spending a lot of mana on activated abilities yep. so you're not casting spells once um once your commander's out you're putting them into the graveyard with a game action and then pulling it out with an activated ability and pulling something and dumping mana into non-spell casty things and that such uh so those are the core mechanics of the set uh i think as far as set mechanics go i like i really like spree I like plot, commit a crime. I feel like it's going to be a, a mechanic that only ever appears in this set, so I'm not super excited. Mm-hmm. I feel like plot and spree can come up in other sets, especially spree. Yeah. Um, and I would like them to. And then outlaws. I feel like there's going to be random cards that reference outlaws in the future. But I, I think spree definitely has uh, the ability, a staying ability. Mm-hmm. Um, these cards, uh, those are the cards that we're going to definitely see. Like. CE long term play in, in formats. Absolutely. Um, plot cards, definitely going to see a more niche, um, <laughs> very specific. Bless me. I'm sure I heard that. I'm sure it was picked up on your mic. I, I sneezed quite loudly. But uh, uh, plot is going to be very niche um, gameplay types. And uh, 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 yeah, we're probably not going to see one off plot cards too often. Yeah. Commit a crime. I could see just a, a one-off card be that you know if you're in a like I said a highly interactive deck just for a value piece. I could see I could see commit a crime come back in like a um, oh my god a new Capenna another sure new Capenna revisit set. a new Capenna. I could see that happening. All right, so we've gone over the core set mechanics. There are a couple of card themes uh, and some cards that we want to point out. Um, 
one of the big ones are the joins up mm -hmm. legendary enchantments uh, that are referencing the core members of the the out the titular outlaws uh, that are legendary enchantments that are have very powerful effects. Uh, so things like Kellen joins up or um, Tiny Bones joins up mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. Uh, there, some of them are a bit niche. Some of them are a bit more powerful than others. Uh, but it's a it's a whole cycle of cards and. I love a legendary enchantment. Sure. I love very powerful enchantments, and pretty much all of them are very powerful. Like, the Tiny Bones one is one mana. Yeah. A one mana legendary enchantment that has a lot of text on it. So They usually have an ETB and then an additional static ability. Yeah. Static. Static ability. I don't place. think any of them are cost more than three or four. No, I'm pretty sure most... Yeah, I think Tiny Bones is the only monocolor one, and then the rest are in three color. Uh, no, Vraska's in two. Vraska's in, in two. But Makes they, sense. They match they're, the. They're, they're from the guilds. They match the colors that they are. The, yeah. Their creature. But Kellen is three. Uh, the the new character that they introduce in this set, I can't remember her name. I know what you're talking about. Well, that's embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> so we also have some new lands. Uh, we got more fast lands in, I believe they're the allied colors now, because I think uh, they were the enemy. enemy. There are the enemy colors now. They're across from each other. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so the fast lands are dual lands that enter untapped if you control two or fewer lands, so they're really good early in the game. Uh, in faster games where you're not getting as many land drops in, they are effectively lands that enter untapped. Uh, and then we have tapped desert lands, where when they enter the battlefield, they deal one damage to a target opponent. Yeah. Um, I don't know where those are going to really land. They have the desert uh, subtype for a land, and there's a lot of desert synergies in this set as well. There's a few other desert synergies in previous sets, but mm -hmm. they're very limited, often either to colors or black. Yeah. They're not bad abilities. They're just niche. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's a bit. It's going to be a bit harder to fetch these tapped duels, which we saw with Murders at Karlov Manor, the fetchable lands that enter tapped and have an ability attached onto them are much, much more useful and valuable yes. than non-fetchable lands that enter tapped and have a static ability. It's the difference between the scry lands and the survey lands. Yeah. Survey lands are very popular because you can fetch them. Scry lands you can't. And then the ability like of, of these deserts to do one damage... That's I've you know that's pretty especially in in a commander format that's pretty non sequential as or not sequential non it's it's, it's not, not as gonna, valuable it's not as valuable as, as say a surveil or even a scry. Uh, I will say I bet those damaging lands are a bit more valued in very low to the ground, burny decks in two player formats. Mm. Um, Obviously, you're going to want your lands to be untapped so you can cast things, but when most of your things are one and two and three mana, making a fourth and fifth land drop that just pings your opponent for one might be more valuable than having the open mana it's in true. some instances. Which I'm sure people are going to be playing around with. Uh, we have two fun cards, the Cunning Coyote and the Resilient Roadrunner. I don't know if you know this, Sam, but they're a reference. I, Do you, I did know that. Yeah. Uh, Wily Coyote reference. The Roadrunner has <laughs> the Roadrunner has protection from coyotes. Hold on, we need to pull it. We need to pull it up. Here's a search of this and there's search. Oh, there it is. The Resilient Roadrunner. It's a two-two bird with haste and protection from coyotes. Uh, and then you can pay three mana to make it unblockable, except by creatures with haste. And then if we pull up the Coyote, which I believe is the first time we have a creature with the creature type of Coyote. Um, I believe it is. Yes, it is the first creature with the creature type of Coyote. It does have haste, so it can be it can block the the resilient Roadrunner. But uh, when it ETBs uh, another target creature you control, gets plus one plus one and gains haste until end of turn. You can also plot it for one in a red. So it cannot block the Roadrunner because it has protection protection from coyotes mm, that's true so the roadrunner could block the coyote the coyote cannot block the roadrunner yeah interesting yeah. interesting you got it, it's a new creature type is funny the art between the two runs together it's obviously a fun reference and we're a big fan of that uh the other one of the other cool cards that i want to point out is a world champion card yeah um, the duelist of the mind uh, the mind. 
So we had the um, oh, what was the fairy? Uh, the fairy mastermind. The fairy mastermind was the previous world champion. Uh, this one is Nathan Stewart. S T E U E R. I don't know what you want me to do with that. I don't know what he wants me to do with that. S- Nathan Stewart. Stewart. I don't like that. I don't like that. Stour. Whatever. Uh, one in a S- <laughs> both. Duelist of the Mind is one in a blue human advisor for star three flying in vigilance. Uh, Duelist of the Mind's power is equal to the number of cards that you've drawn this turn, and then whenever you commit a crime, you may draw a card. If you do discard a card, it triggers only once per turn. Uh, it can block the Fairy Mastermind. <laughs> it can block the Fairy Mastermind. Uh, and you're just getting some more value for cards that you draw. Uh, and it wants you to commit a crime and give you a little card draw. Two mana, I feel like for a, a two mana, something three with Flying and Vigilance is probably going to be... A yeah, like pretty a decent card. Like I said, I think this is one of those commit a crime cards that uh, will have some staying power just because it is it's value. Yeah, it's just value. Absolute, absolute value. Uh, next, we got a new fibble thip. Got a new fibble thip. Fibble thip, lost on the range. One blue blue. For a legendary creature homunculus, 1-1 one, one with Ward 2. So Fibble Thip is going to be a little protected. Mm-hmm. Uh, he also still seems like he's pretty lost. Yeah, he is lost on the range. He is he is quite... He he dismounted Borborygmos. Yeah, dismounted Borborygmos. That would be hilarious if Borborygmos was in the background like fighting something, but I don't think he is. Um, with three abilities on top of Ward 2, you may look at the top card of your library at any time. The top card of your library has Plot. The plot cost is equal to its mana cost, and then you can plot non-land cards from the top of your library. Um, Fibblethip, that is the plot mechanic, as we talked about previously. You are able to use mana to put a card face down and then cast it on a future turn without paying its mana cost. Is it face down? I'm so I'm just looking at the. At is the, it face down? Uh, we have plot on the dust animus two cards over. Exile, exile the card from your hand. Cast it as a sorcery. Okay, yeah, no, it is not. Uh, it, I guess it is not face down. I was. I'm. I still got all the disguise on the brain. <laughs> you know. Disguise. But you basically exile a card and then are able to cast it for free later. And Fibblethip is letting you do that from the top of your library, effectively extending your hand by one, and then giving you something to put mana into if you don't have anything in your hand that you want to cast. Yeah. Not just one, just like continue. I mean, you could just if as, long, you, as long as you have the mana, you could just. All right, I'll just plot this one one mana thing just to see the ah. There's the thing I want. Cool. And as long as it's not a land on the top of your library, you're gonna get value out of that. Uh, but yeah, we have the return of Fiddlethip, which is great. The two big ones that I personally want to talk about are Obeka and Riku, because um, they they both reference some new style of card design that we haven't really seen yet. Obeka, Splitter of Seconds, one blue, black, red for a 2-5 Ogre Warlock with Menace, legendary creature. Whenever Obeka, Splitter of Seconds deals combat damage to a player, you get that many additional upkeep steps after this phase. That is awesome we yeah. had we've had cards that do cleanup phases so you get an additional untap upkeep draw uh but where you only get one this gives you multiple more upkeeps which there are a ton of cards that are kind of all right that have at the beginning of your upkeep at the end of your upkeep at whatever point in your upkeep you get this yeah. effect where now obeka she has a little bit of evasiveness as with menace uh, two five, so probably not going to not be killed by a lot of things that would be able to block her still. Yeah. Uh, and if you connect with her at base, you're going to get two additional upkeeps, so two more upkeep triggers for all of the cards that want you to hit your upkeep. And then if you just buff her, or give her trample and stuff, it gets even more out of control. Yeah, some of my favorite cards that I w- uh, that I was looking at, I was looking at this a little bit, thinking about building it. Uh, and unfortunately, there's not enough support for the way I want to do it, which is the court cycles. The two court cycles yes. from Eldraine, yes. where it's, if you're the monarch, you do this on your upkeep, which sucks because oftentimes, if you have that, obviously people are, one, not going to let you be, be the monarch at your upkeep because, one, they want the card draw, and, two, that's a powerful effect. But if now it's like, I hit you, I get the monarch, now I have two triggers of, like, the red one of the red ones is do seven damage yeah. at the beginning of your upkeep. Do seven damage at the beginning of your upkeep. Okay. <laughs> It's it's very challenging to keep the monarchy, but I think to the shrine cards. Shrine cards are also good. Yeah. There's a lot of one and two cost legendary enchantments and even shrine creatures that have various effects at the beginning of your upkeep. 
Uh, some of them just like adding mana, adding doing damage, mm-hmm. like making opponents sacrifice creatures. Very powerful effects that are not really able to be taken away from you. Uh, but I just like that there's now a new legendary creature that you can build around and use some of these less powerful cards that really want you to have more upkeep. Yeah. Which is awesome. Uh, the other really awesome card that references a new type of card, this is the first time this term has been used on a Magic the Gathering card. Green, blue, red. It is Riku of Many Paths, a 3-3 human wizard that says, whenever you cast a modal spell, this is the first time a card is printed with the word modal spell. Modal spells are spells that have multiple options. So you cast it and it's like, choose one, choose two. You can choose the same one multiple times, that kind of stuff. These are referenced in the rules, yes. but not necessarily on the text of a card at, yes. up to this point. Yes. Uh, and these do trigger off of spree abilities as well. Mm-hmm. Um, whenever you cast a modal spell, you choose up to X, where X is the number of times you chose a mode for that spell. You're not restricted on the number on which option you are allowed to choose and how many times. You can you get three options with Riku, which are exile the top card of your library, and then until the end of your next turn, you may play it. Put a plus one plus one counter on Riku of Many Paths, and he gains trample until end of turn. And you can create a one one blue bird creature token with flying. Uh, obviously, I think the most powerful one there is exiling the top card of your library and then being able to play it until yeah. the end of your next turn. Um, but you're probably not going to want to do that seven times no, in a turn. No. So you're going to be able to grow Riku and give him a uh, trample. You're going to be able to create a lot of 1-1 blockers with flying, which is very valuable. Mm-hmm. I think a 1-1 bird is very, very valuable oh, just absolutely. to have. Uh, and as a passive ability, a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three, and... A lot of modal spells are some of the best like spells that you can cast as instants and sorceries, just having versatility. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them can be done at like one or two mana, so they're very cheap. Uh, and then there's a lot of them that there's obviously the expensive ones that you can get from that uh, want you to have your commander in play, like Jessica's Will, where you can get both of the modes. Yeah. Um, having a new play style and build around commander, I think, is a very fun very fun thing. Riku's probably one of my favorite cards from the set. Riku's a very interesting card and it's nice when they act when they when they do when they explore design spaces that they've been playing with, you know, they've been building for years mm-hmm. instead of necessarily like taking the the core the set mechanic and making a very hyper niche commander for it. Okay. Well, what cards what cards do you want to talk yeah, about? Let's see. Um uh, so one of the first ones is Avon, Avon Interrupter. Ah, yes. So we got another stacks piece here with the Avon Interrupter. You want to go with this? Sure. It's a uh, bird rogue, one white white for two two, as flash and flying, and when it enters the battlefield, exile target spell. It becomes plotted. Uh, the reason I like this is, one, we don't see a lot of stack interaction in white. I mean, Reprieve came out last year. And that was a big one. Mana Tithe is always kind of uh, looming in the white deck. But Avon Interrupter, um, not as good as a counterspell, obviously. But but plotting uh, the spell a spell can oftentimes just negate its effectiveness. Like Absolutely. If you plot a counterspell... You can only use a counterspell at sorcery. You can only then use it at sorcery speed. Which never be able to use it. Or if you like... Yeah, if you... Or um, even just giving yourself that extra turn... When that comes in in white, I think is going to be very valuable. I mean, pre pre sale at six eighty according to uh, MTG Goldfish. Yes. Uh, also, despite the fact that you are plotting the their cards, um, and they would be able to cast them for free, it does also have the stack ability of spells your opponents cast from graveyards and from exile cost two more mm-hmm. to cast, making a plot not nearly as uh, fun to use. Um, we don't have to look this one up. I just wanted to point out that Canyon Crab is now another yeah. ar- another soldier in the Crab King's army. Let's go, crabs. I knew I knew you were going to bring up the fucking crab. <laughs> Annie Flash the Veteran, I believe, is the new character that we were I referencing you earlier correct. as well. Yes. Uh, Annie, Flash the, Annie Flash the Veteran is a three red, green, white, legendary human rogue, four, five, with Flash. It would be really weird if she didn't have Flash, it'd I be, think. It would be so strange. her name. When she enters the battlefield, if you cast her, return target permanent card of mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. And whenever Annie becomes tapped, you exile the top two cards of your library and you can play them this turn. Um, 
obviously the main way you would be able to tap her is by attacking, but there's also a ton of equipment and other abilities that you would could, allow you her, could have to her to tap. saddle something. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, I think six is a little over cost for the suite of abilities that she has. Having flash is kind of not that important. Yeah. In a lot of ways. Uh, it's more of a flavorful thing than anything else. Um, next one I want to look at is the Free Strider Lookout. I believe... Let's see. Free Strider Lookout. Yes. Whenever... It's two in a uh, two in a green for a human rogue with reach. 3-3. Three, three. Whenever you commit a crime, look at the top five cards of your library. You may put a land card from among them onto the battlefield tapped. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. This ability triggers only once each turn. Boo. 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 What's per turn? That that's that being said, we like we said, there are so many ways to commit a crime. Like uh, there's there's so many things. It's like t- pay one, exile a card from a graveyard, or just target their thing. You know, they're in, you know to your opponents in combat. Buff one of their things. You can get four. You can ramp four times each go around the board cycle. in a turn cycle. Um, so I really like that one. Um, and one of the last ones that I wanted to look out look at specifically was uh, Rambling Possum. Rambling Possum. So this is the color break uh, card. So it's in green. It's a two and a green for a possum mount. Three, three. Whenever Rambling Possum attacks while saddled, it gets plus one, plus two until end of turn. That's normal. This uh, It has saddle for one. This is the color break. is. This is a usually a blue ability. Then you may return any number of creatures that saddled this to their owner's hands. Mm. So we don't often see in green an ability to bounce creatures back to your own hand. Uh, and there are a lot of obviously ETBs in green that'd be nice oh, yeah. to just like hit multiple times. Absolutely. And uh, those are often creatures that might have lower power and toughness, so they're not as valuable as attackers or blockers. Exactly. Uh, but in a saddling format. You can also, I want I want you to note this. It has saddle one. You can tap any number of other creatures you control that have power one or more mm-hmm. to saddle it. So you can tap five creatures and then return them all to your hand. Yeah. Um, which is also, a, in a way, something that you could do to protect uh, from suspected board wipes or other mm-hmm. kinds of interaction that you might be afraid of on a future turn. You can only saddle at sorcery speed, sadly. True. But... I will say I, I lied. There's one. More, there's one more card we need to talk about. Uh, I believe it's on the uh, the aftermath sheet. Um, the esoteric duplicator. Esoteric duplicator. So this is. This uh, is on the big score. Big score. This is what we call a problem. <laughs> uh, so it's two and a blue for an artifact clue. Whenever you sacrifice an esoteric duplicator or another artifact, you may pay two generic mana. If you do, at the beginning of your next end step, create a token that's a copy of that artifact, and you can pay two and sack it for it to draw a card. Now, there's an infinite combo that you can draft with this. You this can draft? And Mindslaver. Because Mindslaver is also on the big score sheet. Oh, hold on, hold on. Let's see, Mindslaver. Where are you? Where are you? My, oh, yes, from the breaking news. Yes, the breaking news. Uh, it's a six-cost legendary artifact. Tap, sacrifice it. You control. Pay four, tap. Pay four, tap. You control. Uh, uh, sacrifice mind slavery. You control target players during their next turn. And if you pay an additional two, you then will get a token copy of Mind Slaver. Yep. At the, okay. And well, an esoteric duplicator does not say non-token. It just says when you sacrifice an artifact. Uh, this also, though not in the set, can go infinite with uh, Ugin's Nexus as well, which allows you to take extra turns. Love an infinite combo. Uh, and you referenced the big score. There are actually three total bonus sheets that are going to be included in this set. Yeah. Um, that's what happens when you get uh, really, really arrogant and think that all of your sets are going to have aftermath style, uh, same price or more expensive booster packs of five cards. Should we take a moment to just stare at the camera as though they're Watsy? You disgust us. Watsy. Watsy. Anyway. If you're at home, you're fine. Uh, but the big score bonus sheet is a total of 30 cards that was very clearly an Aftermath style set that they then later integrated. Uh, it does have a couple reprints, but it is mostly new designed cards. And the cards are 
Uh, I will say, I will say, if it were an Aftermath style set, it would be a lot more valuable than Aftermath, simply because the cards that are printed in the big score are uh, unhinged. Oh yeah, some might say uh, you get cards like the Sword of Wealth and what is it? Wealth, wealth and, and Power. Wealth and Power, which gives you protection from instants and sorceries. AKA protection from any interaction, which is a little bit crazy. And it, it they they scare me. <laughs> a lot of the a lot of these uh, big score cards are very scary. We are getting reprints like Torpor Orb as well. People have looked at cards like Tarnation Vista and are like, this is the next uh this is the next Nyctha Shrine to Nyx, and it's like Tarnation Vista enters the battlefield tapped. As it enters, choose a color. Tap, add one mana of a chosen color. One tap. For each color among monocolored permanent you control, add one mana of that color. So, because it is a land, it has one in a tap. That is effectively two mana. Mm -hmm. So, you need three monocolor permanents of different colors to net positive on that interaction, which I think is pretty difficult to pull off because if you're running a deck that already has the ability that has access to three colors you're not going to want a tapped land that only taps for one color yeah you know it might be more uh, especially in commander it won't be as uh as i don't even think it... as i think uh the price that is at the pre-sale price suggests yeah right now it's pre-sales around twenty dollars uh these are the we're looking at the extended art frames right now but the it just doesn't seem like it's going to have a lot of use. I think it's just going to be expensive because the mythic on the on a bonus sheet. I mean, if you do have a way to untap it, then you do have a way to generate mana at as many times as you can untap it. Basically, yeah. As long as you have three colored. But at that point, at that point, you'd be better off with a Nykthos Shrine to Nyx in almost True. any situation. True. Uh, I think the I think the real reason is people want to yell "What in Tar Nation?" whenever they play it. Hey, look, Sword of Wealth and Power. You're just talking about that. <sighs> when a quick creature deals combat damage to a player, create a treasure token. When you cast your next instant or sorcery spell, copy that spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. Pretty yeah, that's, that's probably one of the most powerful uh, swords. We, uh, the sword cycle was done. We didn't know we needed us another sword, but they gave one to us anyway. You know what? As long as there's pairs of things, they'll make swords. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But uh, the entire big score bonus sheet is built around the idea that, like, this is the thing that they've stolen, mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty cool. We also have a new Lotus, the Lotus Ring, a three mana equipment artifact with artifact equipment, sorry, with indestructible indestructible uh, it also has equipped creature gets plus three plus three has vigilance and tap and sacrifice this creature add three mana of any one color and equip three so it's not going to net positive on mana because it does have an equip cost of three unless you can skirt that cost unless you have any of the many 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 ways to reduce equip costs yeah hey how's your uh, pure steel paladin doing uh Pure Steel, that, my equipment deck would love a Lotus Ring. <laughs> right. Absolutely love. Also, plus six total mana investment. It's indestructible, and it gives plus three, plus three, and Vigilance, so you're able to attack with whatever it's equipped with, and then tap and sacrifice it for the three mana, and then you can repeatedly do that. I'm into that. I am into that. Uh, th those are kind of the biggest ones. Oh, oh, Loot, the key loot. to everything, is a green, blue, red... One two legendary beast noble. Uh, it's just a little guy. It's just a little guy. It's just a cute little guy with ward one. And at the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top X cards of your library, where X is the number of card types among other non-land permanents you control. You may play those cards this turn. Just a little bit of value at the beginning of your turn. Yeah. Nothing too crazy. Um, not going to be the 20-ish dollar pre-sale price worthy in my mind. But we get reprints like Grand Abolisher as well. Um, the big score is going to have a lot of really good cards, but it's not the only bonus sheet. We've got two more bonus sheets. Yeah. The Breaking News, uh, which is a different kind of frame. It has 65 cards that are all reprints, and uh, pretty much I think all of them are able to trigger commit a crime. Uh, so all of them interact with your opponent's stuff in some ways, and there's a lot of very powerful reprints available uh, with that as well. I'm not too... Some of them are going to be 60 cent cards. So 
I'm just excited to uh, to whenever I play one of these, uh, mimic the the news announcer fish from SpongeBob. Breaking news. The one I'm the, like it does have. I will say it does have some very expensive. Re- I'm I can't, I can't I can't with you today. <laughs> 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 just can't uh there are going to be some pretty valuable cards reprinted uh mana drain is the one that i would love to get the most uh instant speed counter spell where you get an amount of colorless mana equal to the spell's mana value that you countered uh mind break trap which i believe hasn't been. i think this is the first reprint of it yeah. i think that is the first it's an instant trap uh which is a, a subtype of instance that we haven't seen in a while you can get oko thief of crowns aka the broco oko uh, I don't know if anyone's ever called that before, but it felt appropriate in the moment sure. for me. But then you're going to get things like Bedevil, which we've gotten a lot of reprints Classic, of. Yeah. Uh, Collective Defiance, which is like a 50 cent card. Uh, Detention Sphere, another 50 cent card. Nothing too crazy. Cruel Ultimatum. I love the Ultimatum oh, cycle yeah, of yeah. cards, but again, they're not super powerful. Right. Uh, Decimate, that kind of stuff. Anything in, that stands out from... I enjoy all the uh, the flavor text on the... Uh, breaking news reprints because they're all like their headlines like uh uh, uh there's uh, reanimate local man defies death morticians mortified <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a door that's actually hilarious uh but yeah there's there's obviously going to be a couple of big hits that you can have uh which is going to make people chase it but most of the cards are going to be worth less than a dollar you can also get them in textured foil which make them easier to read and look better in my mind uh and then the last bonus sheet is a special guests uh the special guests is something that's been coming up uh somewhat regularly uh with some of these sets and there's just 10 of them and they're all reprints of uh they're all just reprints with new art and some of them are going to be pretty good we all we obviously just have desert uh which is <laughs> it's it's thematic to the yeah, set it is it is uh we also get things like the brazen borrower desertion morbid opportunist port razor notion thief being reprint is pretty cool uh mystic snake Stoneforge Stoneforge Mystic is probably going to be one of the more power or one of the more valuable ones yeah. that you can get. Uh, I imagine Notion Thief. Uh, Prismatic Vista is a good oh, one. Oh, yeah. Prismatic Vista. That's probably... Actually, that probably is going to be the most valuable one. Uh, it's a fetch land for any uh, basic land. And doesn't count, and does not put it on the battlefield tapped. It puts it on yeah, normal. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the basic. That's but three bonus sheets. Uh, a lot of value is packed into some of these bonus sheet cards. Um, obviously pending what art you get and then obviously which card specifically you get as well um, that is about all that we have to say we've said a out- lot on that we have said a lot on Outlaws of Thunder Junction we've been going for al- almost an hour at this point so um, we gotta let's let's move on to the couple of last well, wh- what are your final thoughts Sam don't rush the Outlaws we rush. the Outlaws well, here's of Thunder the thing. Junction uh, so next Monday we will be doing some pack openings for uh, on our live, and then in two weeks we'll be doing a, uh, a pre-release style limited format. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that this will have some the this have some very interesting build arounds. I can see a lot of it flopping though. Oh, absolutely. A lot of there's the the one of the mechanics we see that pops up a lot is when this enters battlefield or when you tap the, the you get a like a one one mercenary that has tap uh, give target creature plus one plus o. Oh, until end of turn, activate only as a sorcery. There are a lot of those in the Boros. I think that's the Boros kind of archetype. I haven't looked into the archetypes yet, but... I feel like that one could probably take over a little bit, honestly. It could, but... It's if a, you create enough tokens. If you create... That's that's the key. But uh, I think the... I, I feel like this will be a very... These will be very fast games of uh, Limited. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, I think, much like most of these sets... Uh, the the magic specific sets there's obviously going to be some mechanics that you can build around uh i i feel like this is just one of those sets that either you build around the mechanics in the set or the car or most of the cards are just not going to be very useful Mm -hmm. outside of Mm -hmm. this specific set like something like um wilds of eldraine there's just a lot of great enchantment synergies there. Yeah. And you can build around like the the token enchantments that they make, the or the uh the roll tokens the roll and that tokens, kind of yeah. stuff. But there's also just enchantment synergies, which is nice. And then Lost Caverns of Ixalan, you can build around craft with, you can build around discover if you want, but 
there's just a lot of synergy in the mm-hmm. set. Murders of Call of Manor, I think, was a bit too specific in its set mechanics. I feel like this might be a bit too set specific in its mechanics as well, but that remains to be seen. I think Spree's going to come up a lot. You're going to see a lot of... I, I think you're going to see a lot of decks that want some very specific Spree cards in them. Yeah. Like my... Uh, my, several of my decks actually <laughs> are probably going to grab spree some cards, spree cards i think are versatile enough to find their place in 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 most eternal formats as well as most uh modern not modern formats what do they call those rotating formats rotating yeah yeah those yes yeah, standard <laughs> who plays standard anymore that's funny uh so we're just going to wrap up here a little bit with uh, a couple D D things and video game related things for watsy uh first D D has uh, a collaboration with lego right now wizards of the coast released dungeons and dragons red dragon's tale which is a new adventure that utilizes the set pieces and monsters that you can see in the lego set of the same name the adventure written by D D game architect chris perkins is made for level five characters although it does feature some interesting story twists to explain how a group of tier two adventurers could survive encounters with a beholder and an adult red dragon, both of which pr- are present in the Lego set. D&D Beyond account holders can access the Lego themed adventure for free, along with several digital tie-ins like digital dice. Uh, and you can also get the Lego sets at retail right now. Cool. I love a free adventure. Love a free adventure. Uh, Chris Perkins, I think, is one of the better adventure writers that uh, Watsi has right now. So I'm sure he had a lot of fun with that. Uh, I do love that. I like that. I love Lego. Lego's a fun. Lego's a fun product. We are millennial men. We are. We are fans of the Lego sets. Oh, yeah. Built Um, many a Lego in my day. I have. I've also built many. I have a Lego set that I need that I was gifted for my birthday, like two months ago that I need to put together. Uh, But. I like that they're willing to integrate some D&D stuff, and I love that they're just giving it to you for free. Oh, yeah. I do think it's very audacious of them to say that this is the first D&D Lego set when we have all been using Lego characters for minis before we could afford minis. That is true. That is true. I never did that. Oh, but. I definitely I definitely did that. That and uh, little plastic figurines of yeah. Digimon, Pokemon, and... Um, yeah, we've done that. We've done that. We've done that for monsters. I had a Lord of the Rings Monopoly from mm. the early 2000s, and they I had little pewter um, fellowship members, so I just used those as as the character minis for a while. Uh, but yeah, Lego, Lego good, free D&D adventure good, uh, digital tie-ins for people that use the digital assets on D&D Beyond good. I say this is a win. Yeah, and absolutely. And obviously Legos are going to be expensive, so Always. deal with that. Uh, Watsi and Hasbro are also investing 100 or 1 billion, oh, not 100 billion, Jesus Christ, $1 billion into, quote, gaming ecosystems. After the release of Baldur's Gate 3 and Monopoly Go as standout successes, Hasbro and Watsi plan to invest a billion dollars into gaming ecosystems. Larian Studios has knocked it out of the park with Baldur's Gate 3, but apparently they're not going to be going back. Yeah, the uh, we've gotten we've seen some reports of the head of Larian Studios saying, "Hey, we are we're tired of the team really enjoyed working on Baldur's Gate 3. It was a big success. Nothing wrong with Watsi. Our team's just done with it." So I don't believe I believe they're not uh, uh, developing any more there any DLC or and they're not going to be developing Baldur's Gate 4 as some people predicted. Yeah. What I I'm sure they don't want to. I'm bet. I'm sure they want to move on to something else. But with the amount of success that Baldur's Gate Three has and the amount of money, I wouldn't be surprised if they were very heavily pressured into finding a group of people that wanted to make another one. I'm sure Watsy would easily sell it to the next person. I know. I mean, also Larian's been working on it for how? I yeah. mean, it's been in, it was in beta for years and years and years. Yeah, for a very long time. Uh, but along those lines, we do have uh, some screenshots for an upcoming Dungeons & Dragons game. Dark Alliance, Echoes of the Blood War. Uh, There's not really any information, but you can go check out screenshots of it if you like. It looks very gross. (laughs) But that's just one... There's just one example of... uh, some games that they're they're going to be working on. I imagine that they're going to find some company that wants to make a Baldur's Gate 4. Um, I would love if they would experiment with some other 
gameplay styles. I would love to see a like 2.5D turn-based RPG. Mm. Something uh, go approach someone like a Square Enix and be like, hey, can you make an Octopath Traveler style game set in a D and D world, set yeah. on the Sword Coast, on Dragonlance, on wherever? Um, but obviously, they're going to be making a big push because video games are are. I mean, they make a lot of money right now. I believe I, they they get revenue and profits a lot of the time higher than movies and TV shows. The problem is, uh, games like Spider Man Two cost three hundred million dollars to make. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. we also know that um, Christopher Penis has been very interested in <laughs> uh, expanding uh, Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro in the video game scene for several years now. For those of you that don't know, Christopher Penis is who we call Chris Cox, the CEO of Hasbro. <laughs> um, but yes, I remember we, we uh, talked about this about a year ago um, after an re- investors meeting, I believe, mm-hmm. and, uh, mm-hmm. and, and Chris Cox said that one of the one of the big pushes they were going to make in the future was to expand that video game space and yeah a billion dollars is going to billion dollars going to go a long yeah way. you might you might be able to get two whole triple a games out of that <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you see the thing about the quad a game what yeah oh, like, oh, Ubi- just, was it ubisoft you know, ubisoft ubisoft is so <laughs> so stupid with their ter- I remember I they this isn't the first time they've tried to create like a new term to market their game as higher than AAA which is fucking stupid because it's just a classification of budget effectively yeah. <sighs> These video games come these video game companies out here are wildin they're wildin they are wildin anyway uh, that is about all of the news that we have the big obviously the biggest one was uh, the upcoming release and complete set spoiler for Outlaws of Thunder Junction uh, if you are so inclined to look at some of the cards that are designed for the commander decks feel free we are not doing that today that's a, that's a lot it's a lot that is a lot it's a and lot. and it's mostly reprints anyway um, the commander deck seems somewhat interesting, um, but I, most of the, most of the value in these ones, I think, are going to be coming from the reprints. In I a think lot so, of ways. Yeah. But I will say that uh, that is it. Spellslinger deck looks badass, though. Highly recommend. It looks very interesting. It looks a, it looks very fun. Well, it's very interesting because it's whenever you cast your second spell each turn, do X. Mm-hmm. I like that. That's very cool. I like that mechanic. Anyway, we will end this episode episode 64 of the duels and man of dorks podcast every other week as we always do by taking questions comments and concerns thoughts and or ideas from the audience in this case the tiktok live chat as we record this podcast every other week live on the tiktok samuel joe hansel asks who do you think is the best commander in magic oh well that that is such a subjective question right that it is impossible to answer um, now let's go and see what the number one ranked one on EDA Trek is. Please. Uh, the last time I checked a couple months ago was a Traxa. Yeah, that checks out. Let's see. Top commanders. Rank one, Atraxa, Praetor's Voice. Number two, the Ur Dragon. Number three, Miriam, Sentinel Worm. Number four, Lathro Blade of the Elves, which I find interesting. And then number five, uh, Yuriko, uh, the Tiger's Shadow. Um, we'll say since last time I looked. I believe uh, Edgar Markov has fallen a couple of places, and Ishan Two Heavens as one has uh, bumped up there. Yeah, Ishan has Ishan is now number six, and I think that's just because there's an Outlaws of Thunder Junction card that, or some cards that really want to have their abilities triggered multiple times. I think. There's the I believe there's a backup commander in one of the decks uh, uh, for it has doubling combat damage triggers. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, I don't think any of those cards are the best commander. I think the best commander is the commander you like to play. The way you like to play it. The way you like to play them. Also, the five-color Aragorn the Uniter. I know he's four colors, but he's also black. You need a new new stand-up bit. I like that. Uh, I'm not standing. I'm sitting. Friend of the show, Bryce McKenzie, who sent us our lovely deck boxes. Oh, Bryce. Uh, He says, what's up, guys? Haven't been here in a while. We had a daughter. Congratulations Congratulations. on a daughter. Congratulations. Deck boxes are holding up well. Thank you. They are. They are. They were quite lovely. Quite lovely. 3D printed deck boxes. Bryce McKenzie. What a guy. Uh, Marek Sedulselp says, I've been playing a lot of Alchemy on MDG Arenas. Is Phyrexian Obliterator way overpowered, or is it just me? No. 
Um, Phyrexian Obliterator has a very, very powerful ability of when it is dealt damage, you gotta, you gotta, sac- your opponent's gotta sacrifice a lot of shit. Um, the the balancing factor of Phyrexian Obliterator is a, you don't have to block him. He's just a five five. If you're willing to take five damage, if he attacks, uh, if he's left up as a blocker, then he's just a really good blocker. Uh, there are ways to kill him without dealing him damage. Uh, he has four black pips in his mana cost. Pips. So while he is a four mana 5-5, five five, which is a, a good rate, the four mana has to be a specific color. Um, so in multiple color decks, uh, it can be a bit harder to get four black mana to cast him on curve. So he's probably going to be cast a little later in the game. And there's plenty of exiling and non-damaging board wipes and that kind of stuff that can mm. get rid of him fairly easily. Uh, also asks, are creatures like Gala Greeters module? So, uh, yes. I believe in, in the context of the um, the Riku, uh, Riku of Many Paths, it is whenever you cast a modal spell, it does not reference a spell type. Uh, and if we're, we're just looking at the EDH rec page right now, if you look at the creatures, a lot of them have synergies of whenever you cast instants and sorceries. Um, but I believe it will also trigger if you have modal options from a creature spell. I don't see why not. Yeah, but once the creature is on the board, then it's no longer a spell. It's a permanent. Mm, that is a good point. That is a good point. Well, let's let's take a look at Gallagreeters. Great card, Gallagreeters. I like I like Gallagreeters. Uh, whenever another creature enters the battlefield, so it's not a spell; it's a triggered ability. Yeah. So it would not trigger off a of, uh, Rika would not trigger off of that. Um. All right, well, that's about it. That's about all we got. Um, that is about all we got. Uh, if you manage to make it to the end of the podcast, you're one of the you're one of the real ones. Um, at this point, the Duels of Manadors podcast is in a bit of a a bit of a a lot of our stuff. I feel like is going to be changing in the near future. Um, the podcast is still going to go every other week as we always do. We want consistency. And I feel like we've been very consistent. We have not missed our uploads. We eat a lot of fiber. Sometimes sometimes uh, there may have been issues with, like, uh, the podcasting service not pushing, not uh, dra- drafting a podcast instead of uploading a podcast on a podcast services. But if you check all of the all of the avenues, uh, at the very least, you'll find you'll find it somewhere. <laughs> Sorry about that. But we are going to be moving away from tiktok as a platform in a lot of ways uh not because of the ban or anything like that it just uh, for creators it's just it kind of makes sense it's sucking more and more uh you, you the amount of effort you have to put into tiktok and then the amount of benefit you get out of tiktok um We'd, ra- we'd much rather put uh, put great content out on YouTube where it's going to hopefully reach a wider audience and be more uh, beneficial to us to where we can continue to create content. Exactly. As opposed to TikTok, which... Uh, well, l- let, me put it, let me put it this way. You get a million views on a short... Or you get a million views on... A, a million views on YouTube is going to be more valuable than a million views on TikTok. 10,000 views on YouTube in some ways is going to be more valuable than a million views on TikTok. TikTok, you need to make a vertical video that's at least a minute to get any sort of payment out of TikTok for anything. Um, and a million views, you're going to get a couple bucks. 10,000 views on YouTube, if you have a CPM of like a dollar, is going to be $10. Hmm. So the, the dollars and cents, obviously, like we're not trying to freaking chill. No. But... YouTube YouTube is going to be a more of an important platform to exist on for the long term of of this podcast and the long term of Dungeon Bros in general. Uh, if you are if most of the people that found us have found us from TikTok, we TikTok has given us a lot of opportunities. Uh, it's not going to be a change that happens overnight. It's not that we're never going to post on TikTok ever again. It's just uh, it, we're we're. You can probably already tell we're de-emphasizing it a lot. Yes, uh, we don't post nearly as much as we used to uh the monday night magic live streams um we might do tiktok for a little bit while longer but we're going to be focusing more on uh youtube live streaming for uh that 
Yeah. So if you enjoy us and uh, want to uh, continue to hear more from us, make sure to subscribe uh, on YouTube. On and YouTube uh, and wherever wherever you like. Podcast services around the globe and all that. And uh, we're working on a Patreon as well. No details on that yet of timing or what specifically. But I do want to say that uh, from a philosophical perspective when it comes to Patreon and crowdfunding and stuff, um, I don't want to gouge people at all. Uh, we had TikTok subscriptions. We had a couple people subscribe to us, and I set it to five dollars, and that was below what they recommended. Uh, the The value tier for the Patreon is going to be five dollars, and it will not change from five dollars. So it gr- we grow and we get more money if more people join on, um, and that's where we're going to. That's, I think, going to be the emphasis. Obviously, we'll have tiers higher than that where you can get more, uh, more f- bigger benefits. Uh, and then, obviously, one lower tier just to show support. But I, w- I want to approach... There are people that have Patreons where it's like, you don't really get anything unless you're giving them like $20 a month. And I don't like that. No. Like, I don't, I don't want it to be a someone that's in a struggling financial situation where it's like, am I going to keep Netflix or am I going to keep my uh, Patreon for the Dungeon Bros podcast, or the Duels and Manadorks podcast by the Dungeon Bros. Um, we want to give you good value. Yeah. And I think $5 a month is something that is fairly innocuous. Um, I, I subscribe to a Patreon for $5 a month and I don't notice that and I get a lot of value out of that subscription so i want to i think that's just the perspective that we're approaching it from again no specific timings on it and we're only doing this at the end just to anyone that's actually listening at this point you know probably gives a little bit of a shit so but just want to put that just want to put that out there some some things are going to change some things are not going to change at all but we're still going to be our dumb idiot selves talking about magic and hopefully D&D and all that kind of stuff Hopefully, we'll bring that directly to your ear holes more often. More often. Uh, early and ad-free would be the two main benefits mm-hmm. of uh, the Duels and Manadorks Patreon. So when the Patreon launches, I suspect we're going to record on the same day that we normally do. And I think, and we can talk this out off mic at some point, but I think post it as normal for Patreon members and then the following Monday for all the free feeds. I think would make sense. And I think it would be smart to like get ahead on a podcast so that the free feeds don't aren't just missing for a couple of days or something like that. I don't know. That might just be me. We'll see. We'll We'll see. We'll talk this out. We'll let you know more. Uh, But in the meantime, in the meantime, until we meet again, I'll be in tow. I'll be in tow. Oh, lo siento. What? I don't, I don't, I I don't, I speak English. I'm sorry. You barely do that. I, I speak American. Anyway, see ya. <laughs> I was waiting for you to do your bit. You, 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 peace, peace, peace out. out.